The next talk is also about mobile networks. It's cracking GSM encryption uh, by Carsten Nohl. I'm looking forward to this talk. Hey, good morning, everybody. Pleasure to be here, DeepSec in Vienna, and happy to talk to you about yet more GSM vulnerabilities. If if you weren't convinced um, enough of the last talk yet that, that GSM is an inherently broken technology as it's being as it's deployed at the moment. Um, I'm a cryptographer, so I'll be discussing with you vulnerabilities on a, on a different level than um, the, the application level exploit where we were just looking at. Um, that is the encryption that is supposed to secure all the text messages, voice calls, and whatever other data goes over an, as, um, a GSM network. Um, the point I'll be trying to get across is that um, GSM's encryption is outdated, very much so. It's, it's old it's, and has never meant to be a very strong encryption. And by today's standards, it's just not good enough anymore. At the same time, though, it is um, extensively being deployed for more and more security applications. So there's a big discrepancy um, between reality and, and perception here. Um, and I'll be discussing a project that we kicked off earlier this year um, in which we want to publicly demonstrate how broken GSM is. And um, I'll need your help on this. And, but we'll, we'll get to that in, in a bit. So GSM as a technology is um, what I think the most widely deployed security technology in the world. The majority of humankind is using it in almost all countries of the world, um, but it's an old technology. And it has um, a long track record of, of being broken, just never enough, so it, um, it's, it's not being used for security-related applications anymore. Um, the, the history of, of attempts to publicly show that this is broken goes back to, to, to almost um, when the, we, we first knew what encryption um, is being used in GSM. At first, this was a secret cipher, but it was then disclosed through reverse engineering. And just a few years later, people already had very potent um, decryption functions on the cipher itself. For many years, though, um, they were breaking the cipher itself and not the cipher as it's being deployed in GSM. So we had hints, academic hints, that um, there might be problems with A51, the cipher, in GSM, but nobody could actually show that. Um, a little later then, people started brute forcing A51 because not only is it um, a weak cipher, it also uses a, a, a small key, a too small key by, by today's standard. Um, brute forcing still is possible and has always been. It's just very expensive and it could be argued too expensive to actually allow practical attacks. So we're talking about something like 100,000 um, computing years to decrypt a single text message or voice call, which clearly is too expensive for, for most scenarios. And then finally, people applied some, some good crypto analysis um, knowledge and, and um, deployed time memory trade-offs and finally found solutions to practically break GSM in the real world. Supposedly, even back in 2003, people computed those tables that we'll be discussing a lot throughout this talk, um, but they were never released and there's doubt that they actually finished computing them. Then again, two years ago, people uh, a group, a hacking group, set out um, wanting to compute this table to finally show how broken the technology is. And just a very short step from being done and wanting to release these tables, um, they decided not to because of intimidation and perhaps some, some commercial interest mixed in that. Um, so now what I'm presenting to you today is really redoing what has been done before with a few tweaks that make it perhaps um, more practical, but with the one very important tweak, that is community involvement. 
So as much as I'm presenting this to you today, this is not my project anymore. We handed this over to the community several months ago and there's nobody in control of the effort anymore. So this really is something that cannot be stopped anymore as the efforts before were. Um, so the public break attempts have failed um, and, and creating thereby a false perception of GSM security. If so many people have tried breaking it and nobody actually got around to a public exploit that people could use against their own data, they, they can test against their own system, it must be secure, right? Well, we set out to finally show that that's not the case and the motivation for that mostly, at least my motivation is, to point to a large problem that's existing with GSM, that is this technology already being exploited by agencies, criminals, law enforcement. Um, the very technology I'll be, I'll be discussing with you over, over the next few minutes um, is, has been implemented commercially um, a number of times and there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very competitive market in fact for, for selling decrypt machines. They come in several flavors. Um, there's, there's one more obvious um, attack vector. Um, everybody who, who attended um, David Burgess and Harold Felder's workshop two days ago um, heard in length about these devices. Um, they're called IMSI catchers. The idea being that you can just pretend to be a network and thereby attract a target phone to connect all the calls through your base station. Now that of course gives you the ability to, to, to listen in on everything they say and read all the text messages um, they, are, they are sending. The drawback would be that you, um, that you do put yourself out there by actively sending on radio frequencies that aren't yours. You are interfering actively with the victim's phone in ways that they could detect if they pay attention. So while this is the, the more common form of cracking GSM, it's perhaps the least elegant one since it is very much detectable. Uh, which brings us to, to the second form of, of decrypting um, GSM traffic that would be to just listen in on a communication that happens between the real handset and the real base station um, and trying to decrypt that later on or as close to real time as possible in fact given um, a, an FPGA cluster as, as a couple of of companies will sell you exactly for this purpose. Now this talk will, will show you the details of what happens inside of this cluster and what happened um, towards building this cluster and um, propose a distributed network that should take over the functionality of this expensive cluster. So we can, in a joint effort, pub publicly show that really any GSM um, conversation can be decrypted um, given um, sufficient resources. Sounds good so far? If there's any questions throughout, please jump in. These active intercepts, uh, that's an IMSI catcher, isn't it? Um, right. You say it's easily spottable. Is it po uh, spottable by the victim? By the mobile phone itself? No. Um, the, the mobile phone could display that no encryption is being used, for instance. In fact, all phones support that technology, uh, that functionality. They are obligated to through standard. But that functionality can be deactivated through the SIM card and all carriers actually deactivate this functionality. So while your phone could tell you you're under attack, your operator doesn't want you to know for whatever reason. Perhaps because half of the carriers in the world don't use encryption and um, the operators don't want to scare their customers as they're roaming through different countries. But yeah, you could, you could spot this. If you pay attention, if you overwrite that or ignore that bit on your SIM card, um, your phone will tell you you're under attack. You have, con you have to have control over your phone and I think 99 point something percent of all people using phones don't. Right. You, you, have, to, you have to be aware of this happening and, and have to pay attention of, of uh, yeah. Another um, point where this could be detected that is 
uh, by the real network operator. This attack, of course, relies on the fact that you can spoof a network operator within their domain. Now, they can detect that, but, well, they either don't or they, they choose to ignore this since most MZ catches are operated by law enforcement. And what are you going to do if you notice that the police is pulling off a law enforcement operation? And they're going to call the police and notify them about it. Yeah. So they choose to ignore it. Um, yeah, but we'll be focusing on, on the second more elegant solution of, of breaking GSM. Um, now, having, having talked about the, 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 the attack goal a little bit, um, here's just a few applications that have been popping up over the, the, the last um, years that, that are built up on the assumption that GSM is a secure technology, and in particular, text messaging is secure. Um, the last talk should have uh, clearly stated that that's not the case on an application level, but even if you were to fix all the application level bugs and uh, the architectural routing flaws in the network, GSMs can still be decrypted. Um, another big area of where GSM is used as a trust anchor are uh, mobile RFID applications. NFC is, is what the technology is called, the RFID technology when it moves into a phone. And um, good RFID tags use cryptographic keys, of course. Now, if you want your phone to be um, you, to be emulating an, an, a good cryptographic RFID tag, it needs to learn the cryptographic key. And that is usually being sent over GSM to seed the phone. So while it can be stored very securely in a secure element on the phone, the way it's getting to the phone is, is usually insecure. Well, so this just as additional motivation why you would want to stop the belief that, that GSM is secure enough. Um, let's talk about the, the attack we, we're going to pull, pull off. Um, it's a generic time memory trade-off attack that, um, that, that bases itself on the idea of a codebook. A codebook being um, a generic tool to, to break small ciphers, ciphers with, with small key sizes. Um, it, um, it works pretty much like a phone book, say, uh, where you have two data columns, long list of two data columns that in this case map the, the input to this cryptographic function that is secret, of course, to the output, which you can absorb over the air. If you had this phone book and you, you sorted it by the second column, the output, um, you can, based on something you see on the air, look up the secret information that went in computing it. Now, this works against all ciphers with small enough keys. A51's key is not small enough for a normal codebook attack to work. In fact, if you were to just compute this codebook entirely, it would be uh, somewhere in excess of 100 petabytes. And I don't think anybody is willing to spend that many resources just on um, breaking somebody's call. Um, also, computing it in a very straightforward manner by, by, by crunching A51 computations on a PC um, will cost you something um, in excess of 100,000 computing years. So again, nothing we would be willing to spend just to sh show that this technology is weak. So what I'll be focusing on next is show how this codebook can be stored smaller and computed faster, which is all we need on the cryptographic side to, um, to break A51. Um, the steps I'm going to walk you through are um, first, we need to be able to compute A51 much faster than, than the straightforward way on the CPU. We're talking about a couple of techniques we, we applied there on, on different um, technologies, uh, on, on different platforms. I'll, I'll then be talking about how to best store this data in, in um, what's called rainbow tables and how to best parameterize those. Um, since I, I think we found, we found the best trade off so far for all, all the, the rainbow table efforts that have been. Um, conducted on, on FF1. And then finally, I need your involvement in executing um, this set of tools we have produced um, that will produce the tables needed to, to, to crack f 51 We'll be talking about that later, though, and I'll tell you exactly how you should get involved. Um, so first up, how did we um, get a 51 to compute a lot faster um, than we initially thought was needed to break this? Well, first, First, um, one piece of knowledge, um, F51 is, is highly efficient in the dedicated hardware implementation. 
It uses um, a lot of shift registers um, and, and um, things like dynamic clocking, which is trivial to implement if you build your own chip. And nobody's going to build a chip to, to help us crunch these numbers faster. Um, so the best we can hope for is a platform that is as close to dedicated hardware as possible. That would be an FPGA, or at least um, simple enough to execute lots of, of, of small instruction in parallel. That would be a graphics card. So instead of deploying this to CPUs, we decided to, to, um, to optimize it for both NVIDIA and ATI graphic cards as well as uh, Vertex FPGAs. Um, so starting at our 100,000 computing years, um, we first parallelize it massively. That's where you get in. So we can now distribute the load across uh, many people and have each of you compute a little part of this. Um, it, a single GPU um, internally has hundreds of compute kernels that can each crunch an A51 computation. Now, if several say several hundred people with several hundred um, cores into their one graphic cards, executors in parallel, were already down to, to some one year. Um, we didn't stop there, though. Um, we wanted to um, further tweak the, the, the algorithm as much as possible to, to specific, specifically fit the, the computing um, resources we have here. And um, I'll, be, I'll be doing one, one technical deep dive into exactly how we optimized it for CUDA, where we don't just have all these compute kernels, but also memory. So we didn't want to have this, that memory um, go spare. Um, and then finally, and this is, this is just happening this week, we, um, we, we started um, rolling out our bit slice implementation, which um, I didn't, I had no idea could, could give us this good of a speed up. Um, bit slicing being the idea of, um, of computing the same instruction on a lot of data segments. So that the MMX or the SSE and Intel processors. So the, the CUDA card, for instance, gives us the ability to, to execute the same instruction on 64 data items at the same time. Intel even goes up to 128. And let's just porting it to bit slice. We get another uh, performance um, tweak of a factor of three to four depending on the platform. So uh, we're, we're, we're still shocked to find that we can further and further and further tweak it. At the moment, uh, we're running about five times faster than when we first released this, this software in the summer, which was already highly optimized. Um, yeah, so we are down to, um, to, to requiring just a few months on um, an, a reasonably small set of, of ATI or CUDA nodes. Um, Say you had a PlayStation 3 cluster, as um, for instance some, some universities do, you can compute this whole set of tables in, in just one or two months yourself. Um, so come do, doing this, this, this quick deep dive into how we optimize A51 for, for, the, for the CUDA card, um, for those of you who are interested. Um, A51 is composed of a state of, of a total of 64 bits spread over three registers. And all the registers uh, marked in either orange or green here um, determine what the next round will look like once all these shift. Meaning that if you knew all the, the bits in, in the colorful boxes here, you, could, um, you would know what the next four rounds look like, since these are all the bits after shifting that would determine the next rounds. Now, instead of doing one shift at a time, um, as the hardware implementation, the optimal hardware implementation would do. On CUDA, we make use of the fact that we have lots of memory, um, really fast memory, too, on these graphic cards. And uh, we compute four bits at a time by, um, by, by having large lookup tables that, um, based on all of these bits, determine uh, what the outputs are, what the clocking decisions are, and what bits we need to shift into the, to the LFSRs. Since we can squeeze in the, the, these table lookups just in between our, our um, shift operations, um, we get a speed of almost a factor of four by using spare resources that otherwise would have gone lost. Um, similar idea plays to ADI, ATI cards. And if you further bit slice, you get an, get an additional factor of three improvement. So all of this is, is to tell you that um, cryptography often um, can be broken much, much faster than um, the obvious 
um, computational complexity would suggest. Still, I don't think um, the whole idea of, of, of brute forcing a significant part of a, of a um, key space does extend much beyond 64 bits. So ciphers with much larger key spaces, say AES, even a triple DES, um, are not at all affected by this. You can optimize the hell out of it and still take hundreds of trillions of years. Um, so yeah, that, that was the, the one technical deep dive I wanted to do with you, just to show um, the, what, what, what type of optimization effort went into here. Uh, now here's the second deep dive. Um, a little discussion on, on how these, these rainbow tables work. Um, what, what we actually do compute in order to, to um, decrypt or find secret keys for that matter. We were talking about the, the code book before um, in which you can, you, you find the secret information by just looking up what you, what you found as, as the output, as the data that's going over the air. Um, that uh, approach we said wasn't going to scale since we can't compute the whole code book or at least not, not um, entirely store it. So here's an optimization how you, how you can store a code book much compressed. Instead of computing just one hop from one input to one output, you're computing a whole chain of input, output, input, output iterations. So um, if you're starting at, at any random number and you play the A51 function, you treat this the output as the input into the next A51 computation and so forth. And if you do this a couple million times um, and you store only the first and the last row of this table, you get, uh, you get your storage requirements down from, from petabytes to, to, to a few gigabytes, at most terabytes, depending on, on your trade-offs. Um, now, what do we gain if we just store the first and the last column? Um, say that the value we were observing on the air was the, the 49A6 down here. Um, now, in the normal code book, we would, um, we would try to, to look up that value in our, in our stored code book, which is the yellow column in here. But um, in this case, we won't find it. We now apply the A51 computation to it once, get this value, and again, try to look it up in our code book in the yellow column. Again, don't find it. We look, uh, we apply A51 once more, and there it is. We find it in the, in the yellow column in our compressed code book. We know what chain the right value would be in, and we, we start at the beginning of the chain, computing A51 until we again hit the value we were observing. And we know one before that is the secret key we were looking for. Does that make sense? Now, there's a couple of drawbacks to this technique. It works great for, for bringing down the storage requirements. Um, it doesn't actually work in practice as an attack tool, since if this is a million, um, if this is a million links in the chain, you'd have to do a million hard disk lookups just to decrypt one packet, um, which is much in excess, time-wise, much in excess of, of the attack time we're targeting. So we need to first optimize it. And luckily, there's, there's some academics who thought about this a while ago. Um, two techniques I want to introduce and then tell you the, uh, how we combined the two techniques to find what we think is the optimal time memory trade-off for A51. So here's the first technique. Instead of computing all these chains with, with equal lengths, um, you have a defined end of chain criteria, which could be, for instance, half of the bits in your, um, the, the last half of your bits being zero. So you terminate every chain at exactly this end criteria. They'll all be of different lengths, but you can statistically cut off at some point and not lose too much computational energy. Um, so if you do now, again, start at any value that you observed in the air, you compute A5 once until you hit a value that matches this criterion, and only then do a hard disk lookup. So this is the first optimization that helps us um, speed up the attack tremendously by getting away from the, uh, from the hard disk bottleneck. Um, the main problem was, was, was this optimization is that it introduces um, lots of collisions. Collisions being the case where um, if you ever see the same value twice in your chain, um, well, actually, this, these should be the same values. <laughs> um, if you ever see the same value twice in your chain, up from this point, um, the two chains will, will merge, and the next values will all be the same since you're doing the same operations. 
Now, the, more, the longer your table is, the higher the chance that the next chain you'll, you're introducing will collide with an already existing chain, of course. So this puts an, an, an upper limit on the, on the height of these tables. That upper limit, for any practical sense, being much lower than the size of table we need. So we have to start with a new table with a slightly modified function and more and more and more tables. And the attack effort, of course, scales linearly with the number of tables. So collisions are a huge, huge problem here um, that limit our ability to, to make best use of, of this optimization. And there's another optimization, of course. Um, academics are usually a couple of, of decades ahead in, in cryptography um, that help us um, get rid of of collisions almost all together. Um, and that now is what's called the rainbow technique. Rainbow because now in your chain, you have a different coloring of every link going through all the colors of the rainbow, if you so wish. Um, and the, these different functions, the, the different case here, can still all be derivatives of A51. Um, the, the difference could be as simple as XORing a small number into, um, into the A51 input, but it still makes it a distinguishedly different function. Um, if you do compute tables this way, where you have on every link a different function, um, if two values do collide, um, they will not lead to, table, uh, to, to chains merging, um, since um, the, the next function will in all likelihood be different, since there's, million, there's a million different functions. Does that make sense? I was done with the deep dive. Just wanted to, to give the engineers in the room little, little uh, stuff to, to think about. Now, what we did is combine the two, two ideas, of course. Um, we want both little hard disk load and, um, and little collision, so we can, we can store our data in as few tables as possible. Um, the, the optimization, um, the, 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 the point in, in the trade-off curve that we do choose was to do a distinguished point computation not once, but 32 times, um, and each time changing the, the function in the rainbow manner. So what we are hitting the, the, the distinguished point criteria a total of 32 times, and only then after that, call it the end of the chain. And again, only, only store the very beginning and the end. Now this, this point in the trade-off curve might look arbitrary to you, and it somewhat is. There's a lot of assumptions that went in. Um, made assumptions about how much storage we want to spend on this total. Should be something, at least we figure, that could be hosted somewhere kind of cheaply, a few terabytes. Um, we, you, have to put, you have to make some assumptions about how much, how much um, plain text you know for, in a transaction and uh, what success rate you want to get out of it. Um, now, these numbers just went up kind of a lot after talking to David Burgess, who, um, who gave us some, some additional ideas on, on where to find known plain text. Um, so if you do have some control over the data in the network, meaning you are a subscriber to the same cell, which just means purchasing um, a prepaid SIM card, then uh, we are, with our setup, up to, up to, about, uh, up to close to 200% success rate assuming, though, that we have very little transmission errors, which we can't detect on this level. So we'll just assume that the data we're getting is good. Um, on the more realistic assumptions, with, less, with a little less power to the attacker, uh, we're still at about 50% success rate, which is the target for our public um, proof of concept, already assuming some transmission errors and all that good stuff, um, which would then allow us a close to real-time decryption, um, or at least a close to real-time break of the key, which then allows you to go back and decrypt the entire conversation from when it started. Um, so yeah, these assumptions lead to exactly this configuration. There's some discussion about this going on in the mailing list if, if you want to follow up and or want to throw in your ideas. Um, so that was, that was the deep dives. Um, now, if you, if you do want to get involved, here, here's what you want to do. Um, Download the software, of course. The source code available, everything is open source, but there's also binaries for both Linux and, and Windows. Uh, I think Mac OS um, is, is in there somewhere. Um, run them for, for a couple of weeks um, until you have the first table generated. 
um, and then start sharing the table. Preferably, just bring him to Hacker Conference. If you don't happen to come to 2633, um, use our private BitTorrent tracker. I can give you a lock in to it as soon as you have your first table. And then we'll introduce some redundancy as, as much as possible, um, again, to, to shield this effort from, from, from external interference. So nobody's really running any critical infrastructure. This is all happening distributed. But at some point, we will want to coordinate on, on showing that, that this, this is carrying as just a community effort. Also, get involved by, by signing up to the mailing list. There's, there's both cryptographic discussions going on in the mailing list and very practical programming questions, how to further tweak this. Um, good stuff. I, I learned a lot through just, just um, the discussions on the mailing list. Um, now, before, before, before giving you um, the actual nugget out of this talk, let me quickly wrap up um, this, this part of it. Um, so we, 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 wanna, we wanna, of course, not just stop at A51, but um, make this a more general tool of attacking cryptographic primitives that, that don't have a sufficiently large key space. If you have any cipher that you think matches this criterion, anything proprietary, um, perhaps, um, get in touch with us. We'll, we'll be happy to port it for you to this framework. It's extremely generic. It has a lot of backends. Um, even Intel, if you so choose, if, you, if you're not paying your electricity bill yourself. Um, yeah, and we'd be happy to extend the tool. Um, also, if you want to help us um, optimize, port, or, or tweak this in any other way, please get involved. This is a very open effort, and we, we definitely need not just your compute cycles, but also your your, your insights as, as users or perhaps developers of such technologies. Um, now, we'll have this done by the end of the year, most likely. All, um, as much as this is an anonymous effort, we are getting some feedback and tables are being computed. And if some of you get involved too, we should be there um, having all these tables done by the end of the year. If you don't want to wait breaking um, A51 until then, here's another attack that um, that I don't think has been talked about much before. Um, it's, it's, an, an, it's an attack with some more restrictions. On the other hand, it's very easy to pull off. Um, here's how it works. You record a call as it's happening between a phone and a base station. You just record it, not, not being able to decode anything. You might need a wide band receiver if, if there's a lot of hopping going on, but this is definitely feasible. You then, after the call has terminated or after the SMS has been received, um, force the phone to subscribe to your own base station. You initiate um, another channel. You start another channel uh, with this phone, um, this time telling it to use the weak A52 cipher. A52 was intentionally weakened, so it could be exported to, to Eastern, Eastern countries and that. So you force it to use this A52 cipher, which is still present in a lot of phones. And without you even knowing the key that the phone is going to use, you're not telling the phone anything further. The phone starts sending you idle frames. It will ask you, is there anything, is there anything, is there anything? It will just tell you that it's still alive and sending on this channel, but it will do so encrypted. It will take known plain text and encrypt it under a weak cipher. Right? If you did choose to the, the, the same random number um, in, the, in the key establishment, um, it will use the same key that it did before use to encrypt something with A51. Now, after you collected a few of these idle frames, you run a, a cryptographic attack on, on A52. It's very well documented. It has been broken academically a while back. Um, and you just found the key to decrypt the conversation you sniffed earlier. Now, this attack, very straightforward, doesn't take a lot of equipment. All the parts um, are already available. It's not quite as elegant since it's not passive. Um, you have to wait till the, the call terminates and, and get close enough to the, to the victim to force, it, force him onto your base station. And it might not work against newer phones since A52 is, is supposed to be phased out for a while now. But it is still in a lot of phones, I can tell you that. Um, now, here's the tools you want to use to pull this off. Um, you want to use AirProbe, an open source project. 
um, that runs on a USLP to record the data. You want to use either the open BTS or the open BSC, um, again, open source projects, um, to emulate your fake base station and pretend you're T-Mobile or AT&T um, so that the phones are tracked to your base station. You want to use Burham's attack to, to break the A52 in just a few minutes on your computer. And you then decrypt the call again using some, some open source tools from the, from the AirProbe packet. So there was one, one component missing. That is um, a way of telling is it the open BTS or the open BSC um, to, to start ciphering and, and, and ignoring that, the, that it doesn't actually have the key. Um, meanwhile, the, the, the phone um, feels obligated to, to send the idle packets. Now, we did add that um, component last night. So uh, should be should be in the um, in the SVN for open um, B, BSC. Um, Harald, maybe maybe already, maybe soon. It's it's in the Git already. So DeepSec 2009, um, build your own A51 cracker if you so choose from just uh, a U, one or two USRPs and and a little cryptographic insight. Um, think with that, I'm I'm pretty much at. The end of what I wanted to tell you, but I'd be very happy if, if you had some questions and we could start a little discussion here. So, with that, thank you very much. Now we've got some time for questions. Hi, uh, are you legally going to be able to show this proof of concept to demonstrate it? Probably not have against to the real carrier, but we can run our own networks in the in the test frequencies. Um, we were, p for example, allocated here. So I think that would be legal. Yes. It's possible to get uh, frequencies for testing use. That was done on the last CCC, I think, um, on the uh, communication congress. Um, they got from the German uh, authorities a frequency to test and used the OpenBSC uh, during the whole conference. So, yes, I can say this is legal. Yeah, well, if you're worried that people won't believe that this is actually practical, if we don't actually do something illegal, then I must say these, these people are, are illusionist belief, believers that laws will, will prevent criminals from doing crime. More questions? Um, can you name a percentage number in how far the tables are computed on your BitTorrent tracker? Well, it's, it's all anonymous, right? <laughs> so we, we don't know. All, all we do know is um, with lots of tables already and with that, um, with, with that additional insight into, into known plain text, Packets that, that David gave us here. Um, we, we already have a working exploit with some success probability. All that's needed now is to bring that over some critical threshold where people really appreciate it as a threat rather than a technical possibility. More questions? A question about uh, the notification of the encryption disabled and enabled on the GSM network. Is there a simple AT command to re-enable the notification? Um, I don't think there is, since the phone is really obligated to, to do what the SIM card tells it. There is, however, um, prox SIM proxies that you slip just in between your SIM card and your phone, and you could use that to flip the bit. So, so yeah, it it's not elegant. You, you'd probably want access to some, some uh, phone's firmware to patch that, that out of it. Or you get some phone that, that just ignores functionality like that, since, uh, like the, the crypto phone. OK, so w it would be possible with a SIM card reader writer to, to modify this setting? You can actually overwrite a bit. It's locked. But you can, you can change it as, it as the SIM card is being queried for it. Yeah. It's a little clumsy. but you. At least 
to figure out whether in the country you are in at the moment they use encryption, that would be a straightforward way to do it. You mentioned early in your presentation that um, intelligence agencies, law enforcement, and criminals are using this technique. Now, obviously, for the first two, we know that's true, and for the, the criminals, we know they definitely want to, but is there any publicly available evidence of where criminals have, have used GSM cracking for real-world crime? Um, good question. I don't know. So if they, if they snoop around on the Internet a little bit, they'll come across um, advertisement material for such boxes pretty quickly. So if there, if there was a well, um, hmm, if there was a well enough funded criminal organization, they could, um, they could quickly buy stuff like this. Um, it comes with really nice GUIs to, to see all the, the calls that, that are going on, all the, all the SMSs. So this is available on the market. It's illegal to operate, but if you're already a criminal, I don't think you care very much. More questions? Now let me ask a question then. What, what should the network operators do to mitigate this threat? Since we, we just um, in, in, in the second um, attack here showed that, um, that, that, that this is so easily broken. Well, of course, they should go to a better encryption. And fortunately, the GSM Alliance a few years back was, was proactive about it um, and proposed using A53, the yet better encryption that's used in in, in 3G um, for GSM. A lot of phones already support that. Um, I think my BlackBerry does, um, but no network in the world that I know of does support it yet. So now it's up to the network operators to upgrade um, their, um, their, their, their um, systems to the 21st century, um, enabling people to use a standard encryption that any 3G user already um, gets to use, but GSM users don't. So it's really up to the network operator. One, one note though, um, this very attack where you, you replace one cipher with another um, and break the easier one also works against A53. So really what you want is a phone that only ever uses A53, which of course breaks all backward compatibility um, so that doesn't seem to be a quick fix. First step would, of course, be to enable users to use A53 and give them a notification on the phone when that's actually the case, right? But as I said, no quick fixes here, unfortunately. And, and that attack also applies once uh, A52 is correct, uh, A51 is correct, um, can be used for A53 uh, using A51 as a weaker side. Exactly. So I don't think there will be very many phones that speak both A53 and A52, since the one is supposed to be phased out while the other one is being introduced. But as soon as you can break A51 clearly, you can substitute A51 here and A53 here, exactly. Yeah, so this attack still carries. Uh, I, I'll come to you soon. Um, any comments on the lifetime of GSM uh, base station equipment? Because um, this really depends on how, how long this lifetime is, so I don't see that uh, operators will phase in new equipment soon. I, I, would, I, I would have thought that's the case, but even new equipment doesn't have A53 by default. It's a very expensive upgrade by the network operators that you could, in theory, though, roll out to old equipment as well. Okay. So it's just a matter of investing into security, not a matter of getting rid of old equipment in this case. I did not understand because, uh, why the same random uh, gets the same key even if you change the uh, underlying cryptography system. I might miss something uh, on A53. It might be the same design as decision to use the same uh, key generation scheme, but that's not necessary. Or well, the, the the key is not generated by A512 or three. The key is generated by other functions, they're called A3 and A8, on the SIM card. And every SIM card implements them exactly once. You will always use the same mapping, ma mapping from a secret key KI and a random number to key KC that's actually being used here. And only after that it starts using A5123. 
And the key is dictated by the um, base station in that case. In the the random number is, is sent by the base station. Okay. So we can control this. And it's, being, and it's sent in the plane before, so we can read it. So it's really trivial to make it the same. Yeah. Well, try it out if you have two USRPs. You can break your own phone calls. Don't try it on a real network. It's illegal. <laughs> yeah. Then, if there are no further questions, but I think you will be available during the coffee yeah. break. So let's start the coffee break. And thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, guys.